Welcome everyone to the Definitive Guide to B2B Marketing Operations. My name is Dave and I'm really excited to be hosting this conversation today. This webinar is recorded, so if you miss anything, don't worry. We'll send around a, little, a video a little later today. We'll also have a few minutes for questions at the end, so feel free to put them in the GoToWebinar box along the way. Before we kick off the presentation, I'd like to pro out a little bit of background on why we put this webinar together. You've all likely seen Scott Brinker's Marketing Technology Super Graphic. This is the 2015 version, so I can only imagine how much bigger and more complex the next version is going to be. If you look here, marketing operations is a huge component of the technology landscape, but even our subset is really complex and noisy. We started looking at this graphic and asking ourselves, questions like, how do I learn about all these categories? How do I know what's relevant to me? And what does good technology in these categories even look like? And that's why we reached out to the best of breed solutions from all the B2B marketing operations categories to have them educate us on why they exist. And as you can tell from the roster here, we've got some really great speakers from some amazing brands. All these people are literally at the top of their fields and their categories, so get ready for some knowledge. And this isn't going to be a typical webinar. Think of it more as speed dating than a classroom. Each presenter is going to spend about five minutes on their space, and then we'll move on to the next one. It's going to be fast-paced and fun, so let's go ahead and get started. Adam, why don't you start telling us a little bit about tag management? Great, thank you so much, and thanks to everyone for joining today. My name is Adam Corey, and I head up marketing here at Telium. And Telium is known for being the leader in tag management, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what tag management is and the problems that it addresses uh, at a greater scale. So if we can advance to the next slide. You know, often when we think about tag management, for those of you who may already be aware of it, uh, tag management helps marketers and businesses manage all the different web and mobile implementations that they have. Uh, these are often called tags and helps them manage getting them on their website, managing the data that flows through them, and really most, most importantly helps marketers become more agile. But what we often don't think about when we talk about vendor integrations or vendor management or tag management is how we can use this to better engage our customers everywhere. If we think about what tag management is really doing is it's allowing us to work in a vendor neutral fashion and integrate the same understanding of data and the same understanding of a customer across my entire stack so that I can have one clear, consistent way to work with my vendors and therefore work with my customers regardless of the channel that they're on. And I think it's only fitting that, that we talk about this as the topic uh, for today's webinar, which is around navigating that increasingly complex MarTech landscape. Uh, that slide, which has become a bit of an eye exam from Scott, Scott Brinker of the number of vendors that are out there, if you have to go and explore how each one of these in your stack that you leverage are going to work together, that becomes quite daunting when you think about not only implementing them, but leveraging them to create a consistent experience across all of your channels. So as we switch ahead, you know, we, we talk about uh, where the problems really exist. And I think for, for all of us, we might have a slightly different view of, of our customers at every different channel. And this really creates a fragmented customer view across the board. So if we think about uh, the, the stack that you have, your email system has a little bit of the data about the people that you're reaching. If you're engaging people on social, you might just know uh, their profile information on social, but that might not be connected to email. And then each other channel, whether it's your website or your mobile properties, your product itself, if, if for those of you like, like Telium that might have a SaaS product that has a lot of the customer experience that exists there, as well as events or offline or back office data, all of these are actually creating a separate understanding of who somebody is, and they're not necessarily all talking to one another. And that's really one of the first places that tag management helps to solve the problem. And if we advance to the next slide, we'll show a little bit about what tag management and what data management really looks like before and after tag management. You know, I often talk with folks about, you know, what is tag management and where did Telium start? And really, Telium didn't start to solve the tag management problem uh, which is just getting tags on pages, it really started 
to solve the data problem that's inherent inside of tag management. If I'm implementing each one of those 20 or 30 different vendors that I work with on my website, that could be my analytic solution or my call tracking solution or, or uh, you know, my voice of customer or chat solutions that are out there, if I'm implementing each one of these separately, they're not necessarily able to understand the benefit or the data that flows to another one. So with tag management, uh, this is where I can start to experience a lot more efficiencies. Uh, because otherwise I'm dealing with independent implementation cycles. My vendors don't necessarily speak the same language or don't know to speak the same language because I'm not communicating with them in a common language. And if I'm relying on my entire business logic being implemented in JavaScript code, it's really not accessible to everybody. Um, it's really been def defined and developed by perhaps a developer and not something that's readable by other humans on my team. So therefore, there may be some questions about the data quality and the implementation decisions made. And so if we switch ahead, tag management is really designed to build the foundation uh, for, for your business and really for today's agile marketers. So instead of having 20 or 30 different JavaScript implementations managed by your development team that are sprinkled throughout your site, tag management is one tag, one implementation on your website, and then allowing marketers, business users, and developers to work inside of interface altogether so that way as they want to go implement new solutions or optimize the solutions that they already have they're able to do so in much less time so that ultimately frees up resources it allows us to shift our focus from playing the game of whack-a-mole with with implementations and allows us to get to market a lot faster and then focus our energies more on optimizing my vendor integrations and how I engage my customers as opposed to trying to just get them off the ground so tag management really focuses on making sure that your data can be unlocked so that you can power really a universal identity uh, across all of your vendors. So therefore you have a single understanding of your person that's engaging on your website or your mobile application. You then get the ability to enrich that data with new attributes about them, audiences perhaps that you could define, even merge in other data sources like offline data, and then connect that information to every vendor in your ecosystem that therefore extends out to the customers in every channel, regardless of the devices that they work on. And with that, I'll go ahead and pass it along to Dave. That's excellent, Adam. Thank you so much. I love that concept uh, of data unity and tag manage management has uh, certainly been a, a benefit to us um, here at Visible. So now I'm excited to talk to you all today about marketing attribution. Uh, I run marketing at Visible and care deeply about being a revenue-focused marketing team uh, and bringing that in, into our operations. So my section here will dig a little bit into what is marketing attribution and what a good marketing attribution model looks like. So let's go ahead and get started. So simply, marketing attribution is all about marketing and sales alignment. I think this is both from a data perspective, but also connecting the two teams um, from a culture perspective. Uh, the really important piece with marketing attribution is that it enables reporting and optimizations based on downstream metrics. Uh, a good example of a downstream metric is sales opportunities uh, or revenue. And this really lets marketers meet sales on their own turf uh, and be the revenue heroes of the team too, um, but also not be patting themselves on the back when the marketing team has maybe hit the lead goal, um, but sales fall short for the month. So it's really about this concept of aligning the two marketing and sales teams. So this past fall, we ran a survey to a few hundred B2B marketers um, asking them what attribution model they use. And surprisingly, 25% said they aren't using any attribution model, um, and most B2B marketers are only doing single touch attribution. And when you don't have an attribution model in place at your company, or maybe you don't have the right one, you start to optimize for marketing itself, not the desired outcome of marketing, um, such as those sales opportunities or revenue. In other words, you might start looking at leads and cost per leads, uh, and, which is a big disservice to your sales team, uh, but also the growth of your company. And this is really up to the demand team and the marketing operations leads to look at and ask themselves, what is our attribution model? Is it the right one? And if not, go solve that data gap. So on this next slide, we'll look at what a framework is for uh, good attribution. 
So as I mentioned, single touch attribution isn't ideal for B2B, and uh, I'll explain why here in a second. Um, the biggest problem with single touch is that it introduces what's known as channel bias. Um, this is because the sales cycle for B2B companies is fairly long, unlike, say, buying a box of Kleenexes. Um, and what that means is basically you make marketing decisions based on SKU data, which of course is a really big problem for marketing operations. For example, if you're doing first touch attribution, uh, the from first column here, you by definition are excluding channels like email marketing, retargeting, all your sales enablement efforts, um, which we all know to be core pieces of B2B marketing performance. And the inverse is true for last touch attribution, uh, the, the final column here. Uh, in that case, you completely exclude the brand awareness stage of the funnel um, and just focus on those activities that are happening kind of right at the sales handoff. And so we, um, at, at Visible, we compared our own marketing to a first touch model and to a multi-touch model and found that our revenue allocations were off by as much as 30%. Um, and that's a really big impact to the organization. If you're not familiar with, with multi-touch attribution, it's simply applying the revenue credit for a deal back to multiple marketing channels to determine the revenue and ROI of your efforts. So well, giving a little bit of credit to social, a little bit of credit to retargeting, and maybe a little bit of credit uh, to email, kind of in this example here. And the second piece to a good attribution model is making sure you're measuring your digital and offline channels, like events, together and not in isolation. You don't want to be double counting your channels just because your attribution isn't connected. And just like how your attribution model can introduce channel bias, it can also introduce persona bias. Um, so even if you aren't doing a company's marketing yet, it's important to view all the people involved in a deal kind of in, in one model. Um, obviously some personas like the researcher will have more top of the funnel touches uh, versus the decision maker. Um, but we all know that decision maker persona is just incredibly important to deals and you need to be accounting for it. But if you're doing single touch attribution and kind of measuring the uh, individuals instead of deals, you're only going to be applying that revenue credit and optimizing your marketing for that researcher. So when you include multi-touch attribution, account-based views, uh, into your marketing, revenue performance, you can really start to deliver value to your organization in a really big way. So speaking about uh, account-based marketing, uh, John, I've been hearing a lot of account-based marketing out on the web. Why don't you tell us a little bit more kind of about you and, um, and the space? Sure thing, Dave. Uh, no, re really great content there, and I think um, you know a lot of us have been hearing about account-based marketing recently, and it really over the last 12 months, it's really started to take off. And you know the points you made, Dave, about being able to focus on the right types of metrics and the type of activity that are that is going on within an account and and how they're engaging with your your marketing and your different channels is is really key to understanding. Uh, you know, why it's such an important focus for, for B2B marketers. And if we, uh, you know, start to look and think about uh, in the next slide here, you know, why account-based marketing is so uh, valuable to, to B2B marketers, it's because of what it does for us as an organization. So Dave, when you were, you know, looking at attribution and thinking about those down funnel metrics, those are the same things that salespeople focus on. And, you know, as marketers, our goal is the same as sales. It's to grow our business. It's to drive retention and upsell or to drive new customer acquisition. So as marketers, we have to be focusing on the same types of elements that our salespeople are focusing on. Uh, you know, instead of just thinking about personas or leads or MQLs, you know, as you said, Dave, we have to be thinking about opportunities and revenue and other metrics that help move the needle for our, our business. Um, because when we do that, what we deliver is a product to our customer, which is sales in, in the form of sales opportunities, um, that supports their reality and need. Uh, as marketers, again, you know, we think about those personas and leads and, and those types of metrics, but salespeople are thinking about, I need influencers, I need buyers, I need accounts that are interested in our solutions. And so when we start to think about it in that context and we start to align our programs and our goals around those types of, of metrics, what we do by default is start to create things like uh, a customer-centric experience. We start to think about how to align the programs and our messages 
to a buyer's journey that is consistent, not only from the first touch to the middle touch to the last touch, but also to the sales conversation and then through post-sales so that our buyers feel that we're not just a company trying to sell them something, but we're actually here to help them and support them in their growth by use of, of our products. Um, and then again, what that, that process does by default is it also allows marketing to connect its success to the business metrics that grow the business. So things like, like revenue and things like that. And uh, if we start to look at the, the next couple slides here um, in thinking, you know, Dave, you're saying about the, really the, the growth of account-based marketing and, and we're hearing so much buzz about this. Uh, we've been doing some research over, over the last year, uh, both uh, with some different firms, Demand Metric and with Serious Decisions, um, to start to look at the growth of account-based marketing and how it's being adopted. And I think what you know, this slide and the next slide uh, really show to us is, is we're really kind of at an inflection point or, or you know, the knee of the curve uh, as it relates to account-based marketing. You know, two years ago, maybe 20% of, of B2B marketers had heard about it. Almost every B2B marketer has, has heard about it this, these days. And I was talking to a colleague the other day, and she told me she saw a conversation on Facebook that was kind of a funny joke. And it was, how do you know two, two B2B marketers are talking about account-based marketing? Their lips are moving. Um, so I think it's, it's a really hot um, you know, trend and approach to, to being successful as, as B2B marketers. And if we go to the, the next slide, um, and even the, the one past that, um, you know, again, here's some more stats where we kind of look at, at and support the growth and why we're kind of at that inflection curve. But, you know, why it's becoming so popular is, is I think, um, in the next slide, we can look at the process of how it's simplifying what we do as, as B2B marketers. So it, it oftentimes um, we can get really deep into things like attribution models and try to look at, uh, and if we could advance to the next slide, please, uh, and start to look at things like, you know, this exact channel and what did it do and what's the revenue correlation for this specific email and things like that. And, and those are great indicators as marketers as to how to optimize our programs. But when it comes down to aligning our, our sales and marketing departments, as Dave was speaking, it's, it's, a, it's a cultural alignment that goes on within the organization. And, you know, we have to start to think about what are the metrics that we're all still, still going after. And, and yes, we have to optimize our campaigns and we have to understand the right channels in which to invest our budgets, uh, but we also have to think about how we're coming together with, with our counterparts, so our sales teams, our customer support teams. And so when we're getting started with an, any B2B marketer who's getting started with an account-based approach has to understand that there's a couple of different components to it. There's a methodology uh, foundation to it, and then there are technology components to it. Uh, at Demandbase, we provide technology that helps B2B marketers deliver on an account focus. But there are a lot of other technologies out there outside of our product suite that can also be used for account-based marketing. So when we begin as a first step to align with our sales and marketing uh, or align those departments, we start to look at things like communication, setting those types of goals. How are we going to work together to identify uh, accounts? And then we want to come together and actually develop a target account list. So whether you're using things like predictive technology, uh, whether you're having kind of an anecdotal input by both sides to say this is a good count, this is a, a bad account, uh, you know, maybe the, the uh, predictive elements, you know, it gets you 80, 90 percent of the way there, but there's, uh, you know, an anecdotal or a, a personal element, a human element that goes in for the last 10 percent to make sure you have a, a quality list that then you can both execute against. Um, and then once you have that list and you have this conversation going between the departments, you want to start to develop those marketing plans. And this is where, you know, the technologies that are out there come into play. So whether you're going out uh, and trying to influence an account with account-based advertising uh, and communicate and target just those accounts that matter to you online with you, or that are on your target account list, or you're creating those customer-centric experiences when they come to your website and see a, um, a, an experience that aligns with what, what they saw in an ad, even if they didn't click through it. Um, all the way to, you know, helping drive sales intelligence uh, by providing information to your sales teams about what those accounts are doing on your website. So, Dave, you had that, you know, the, uh, the researcher, um, the lead, and then the, the uh, I guess, the economic buyer. Those are all different types of people that are going to engage with content on your website and with your different programs. So, giving that type of sales intelligence uh, is really going to help your sales and your customer support teams focus on what's valuable to your prospects and your customers 
and help them be more effective in, in driving uh, the relationship growth with them. And then ultimately the measurements. So again, Dave, you, you, you put some great measurements out there of, of you know, opportunities and revenues, and, and those are key drivers of, of any business's growth, especially when you can start to look at you know, from an opportunity, you know, what are the conversion rates between different stages of the pipeline and things like that. But there are other metrics as well that you want to focus on, so things like velocity of deals, um, annual contract values, things like that that can really be uh, other key indicators for the health of your pipeline, the health of forecasting the success of marketing. Uh, one thing we saw in, in Demandbase uh, after we implemented account-based marketing and, and have gotten about two years into it was um, we saw, you know, we have a couple different products, a couple different tiers we work with as far as company sizes and, and industries and things like that. And we saw within one, one uh, segment that actually the, the velocity of deals slowed a little bit. But we also saw the close rate within that segment go up 250% and the annual contract values go up 40%. So, you know, it took a little bit longer to close those deals. And, you know, I could go in long-winded into uh, the data behind that. But what we saw is we were closing more of them at a higher contract value. And you talk to any chief res revenue officer, uh, any CFO, any head of marketing, and they'll make that trade any day of the week uh, because that ultimately translates in, into more revenue and growth for the organization. So, so an account-based marketing approach is really about bringing together the teams in a synergy and focusing on the accounts that matter most to grow the business and focusing and driving the same metrics across both teams for success and that move the needle to the business. And I think, you know, that simplicity of it, um, it really helps at the top line or the top level of a marketing organization to show how marketing is making an impact for the business and driving growth. And, you know, I think it's really key to kind of marry that simplicity uh, at the reporting level and forecasting for the growth of the business with the, the deep attribution data that we can look at through, you know, different systems like uh, attribution or tag management, things that give us the insight into the performance of our campaigns that we can then use to adjust and then, uh, improve the performance of those campaigns. So I think that's really why we're seeing the, the success of account-based marketing and so many B2B marketers looking to it to find out, you know, how they can improve the success of what they're doing. That's great stuff. Uh, that's great stuff, John. I think uh, when we moved to account-based marketing at Visible, the the first thing that sales said was was thank you. <laughs> uh, I really love that alignment point there, and um, speaks a lot to ABM. Um, you mentioned talking about target accounts and intelligence and um, making great account lists. So Sam, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, how you think about market intelligence? Yeah, you bet. Um, and I think there's there's sort of a, a central narrative emerging in this webinar that is, you know, how can marketing ops uh, work more closely with sales and, and stay aligned? And uh, I think the big sort of underlying um, factor in marketing intelligence is being able to provide that data layer um, and being able to provide that intelligence between either, if it's an ABM strategy, intelligence on accounts, um, if you're a little bit too young or too immature for an ABM, it's it's providing the, the right signals that help you understand which accounts should be reached out to and when. Um, so uh, if you go on to the next slide, I'm going to quickly define um, uh, market intelligence. So um, very broadly, it's market-specific information that guides decision-making. Um, and I understand that's an incredibly vague definition, but in some senses it has to be. Um, so let's boil it down into sort of three main components. Um, so you've got two types of um, data that can be collected in a market intelligence strategy. You've got your qualitative, uh, so things like customer feedback, surveys, any sort of analyst research, um, and also any information that can be gleaned from customer or prospect uh, calls. So um, that's one aspect, and then you've got quantitative data. So this is sort of that foundational layer of market intelligence that every business is going to have, uh, firmographic information about the company, uh, things like revenue, industry, size, um, and other, and other firmographic indicators. Um, and then you've got sort of an external versus internal dialogue going on. So mostly, uh, most of market intelligence is collected, so um, it's external information, uh, whereas uh, a business intelligence strategy would be more sort of the internal data that's used to improve uh, processes that way. Um, so we think of market intelligence, we think of external signals. So what are our prospects or our customers telling us that we can then use uh, to create better communication um, and better personalization? Uh, and then lastly, market intelligence, uh, the crux is that it's embedded into your existing workflows. So 
if you're a marketing ops professional, this, this generally means your marketing automation platform. Um, think about ways of, of combining signals into marketing automation that informs sales through the CRM, uh, it, it improves uh, support through the customer engagement platform, um, and, and all these different ways of creating this sort of dynamic flow of information as it comes in. Uh, so if we move to the next slide, um, talk about a little bit why market intelligence is so important. Um, I think it's always been uh, incredibly important, but there's two sort of competing trends, uh, complementary trends that are going on right now. Um, everybody's aware of the age of personalization. Uh, inboxes are flooded. Uh, voicemail boxes are, are chock full of, of, of spam and garbage messages. It's really important to have you know, the, right, um, the right data at the right time on your prospects and to be able to leverage this data within your current systems to you know, sound more informed on a cold call, send more personalized emails, uh, customer communications, um, all that good stuff. And then um, I think a, a great theme that's been emerging in this webinar has also been the idea of this, uh, this sort of more complex buyer's journey. Um, so I know um, Dave talked a lot about this in his attribution segment. Um, there's lots of different touch points now. Uh, buyers have more information than they've ever had before on sellers uh, via uh, support, chat rooms, um, social networks. Um, there's dozens and dozens of comparison sites out there. I just actually, <laughs> for this webinar, just out of curiosity, I did a report, or I did a, a Google search for um, Datanize versus a few other companies in our space, and there were like eight or nine listings that um, were all sort of the same idea, and it just sort of speaks to this wealth of information that consumers now have about the products that they're looking to purchase. So market intelligence, um, is all about kind of informing, having that data layer to inform buyers, regardless of where they are on the journey, and also to inform sales reps in particular about where their buyers are in the journey. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, a big piece of this sort of staying in tune with this new funnel is moving from a static to a signal-based intelligence strategy. So what I mean by that is, uh, when I think of a static market intelligence strategy, I think of sort of that foundational layer, right? So having information, baseline information about um, a company, uh, their demographics, maybe you've got some information on their location, the industry that they play in, uh, and, and maybe their revenue if you're lucky. Um, but the way that, you know, the way that buyers work now, um, it's all based on signals. So you have to be able to understand what your buyers are telling you and be able to react in time. So for example, um, tons and tons of signals are being, uh, are being broadcast from a prospect's website. So for example, um, if you look at the tech stack, um, technologies are always changing. Prospects are always changing technologies. Being able to understand how your technology might fit into these changes, for example, if they've just dropped a uh, competitor's technology, if they've just added a complementary technology, maybe it's something you've got uh, a great integration with, being able to stay in touch um, with these types of signals, in addition to things like traffic spike or ad spend or um, things like uh, funding rounds, company growth, all of these things are great buying signals that you as a marketing operations professional can take advantage of and sync the sales to enable them. Um, so <clears throat> here's, a, here's sort of like a quick model um, that shows how this data can be imported. Oh, actually, if you go back. <laughs> Here's a, a quick model that shows how the data can be imported through um, any sort of marketing automation platform. And then, um, you know, if it's uh, a HubSpot's marketing automation team, they actually saw a 300% three, increase um, from lead to opt conversion um, from the intake of these signals. Great. And then if you go to the last slide, um, just a quick um, four steps getting started guide. Um, a, lot of, a lot of companies have already acquired a lot of the relevant information. But it's about getting that foundational layer first. So understanding what uh, data points are important for your team, uh, whether it be sales, marketing, or customer success, and making sure those are, again, synced to the existing workflows that you have, marketing automation, CRM, customer engagement, uh, any analytics platform that's going to help you make sense of this data, and then being able to segment. So if you think about being able to create email drip campaigns based on um, the different firmographic data points, um, the different technologies that a company is using in their stack. And then last but not least, uh, the fourth step to take it to sort of greater heights is the idea of informing sales activity with these buying signals. So being able to actively 
uh, take these signals, put them into your marketing automation platform, and then push them to sales so that they can reach out at the right time with the right message. Um, so that's, that's kind of marketing intelligence in a nutshell. Thanks, Sam. That's awesome. And great comments on personalization and the shifting of the buyer's journey. Um, we all know that mobile is a huge channel, communication channel for, for that buyer's journey. So I'm excited that the next speaker here is Julia. Um, so Julia, why don't you tell us a little bit more about how to think about measuring calls and, and mobile um, and the, the broader call intelligence space. Sure, yeah, thanks. Um, so my name is Julia Stead. I'm the director of demand gen at Invoca, um, which is a industry-leading uh, call intelligence platform. Uh, and basically at this point, I just want to kind of take a step back from the, the deep dive into technology. Uh, and if you, if you go to the next slide, just start by taking a look at the, the mobile landscape and how it's kind of impacted us as marketers over the past couple of years. So I don't think any of us think of mobile as sort of an isolated strategy anymore, right? It's, it's really become kind of the home or one of the main touch points for all of our different marketing channels, whether it's email or search or our website. Um, everything is sort of being driven by that mobile experience. And so uh, as a result, it's really changed how our prospects are interacting with us. Uh, whereas before, uh, it was easy to kind of optimize a, a form, a lead form for that desktop experience. It's not always the most convenient way for people, for prospects to interact with us when they're on their mobile device. Often the, the more preferred action is, is that easy step of, um, of taking or clicking to call and making a phone call. And so as a result, uh, it's, it's kind of no surprise that across all industries, um, including B2B and kind of the, the high tech space, we're seeing a huge increase in the, the volume of inbound calls to businesses. Um, you know, that's just one example there um, from mobile search alone. Um, we're expected to see over 70 billion inbound calls um, in this year. So uh, if you go on to the next slide, this is, this is just kind of an interesting soundbite that I wanted to share that was just published last week. Uh, so last year, Amit Singhal, who's the, uh, the senior VP of search at Google, spent the, the entire year kind of living in a mobile first mindset and really just using his mobile phone um, for almost all of his computing um, and, and his day-to-day -day kind of uh, digital needs. And his, his main takeaway was um, he realized that on mobile devices, he really wanted to act more. And that, that balance between acting and consuming when on a mobile device has really shifted more towards urgency and acting. Um, acting such as in uh, placing a call to a business. That's the most simple kind of action that you can take when you're on a call. And so this is something that we've kind of seen played out across uh, a lot of our customers and in our own um, engagements with prospects as well. I, I wouldn't say necessarily that you want to, you know, only, only push people to call your business, but as a marketer, it's really important to be uh, giving people the choice to interact with your, your company in whichever way is most preferable to them, whether it's engaging with you on social, sending you an email, filling out a form on your website, or making a call. And so I think one of the, the first things that marketers really need to be aware of right now is do you even have a phone number on your website or are you even giving them the, the option to call since it's, it's an action that they want to be taking. So if we go on to the, the next slide, uh, weaving technology back into the story here, I'm pretty sure that everyone on, on the webinar today has some, some pretty solid technology baked in to be tracking all of those digital touch points uh, with their prospects. Right, whether it's um, tracking conversions on the website or through email and, and social, we've all got pretty robust systems to, to measure all those clicks and engagements. But when someone instead chooses to, to call into your business, you know, whether they click on a search ad and end up on your landing page, maybe they've got some questions and want to call in, or they get one of your nurturing emails and are ready to speak to someone, uh, when, when they place that call, it's really sort of this kind of black hole when it comes to marketing attribution. And for us as marketers, we, we don't get that visibility into what's driving the call, what happened on the call, was the lead record even properly created or the call properly uh, logged back to the campaign that drove it, and so on. So I think a lot of us really um, think that we're becoming pretty good at this omni-channel marketing thing, uh, but if you're, not, if you're not tracking those offline conversions that are driven by your, your online spend, um, you're still really missing a crucial part of that puzzle. And so that's really where, where call intelligence comes in. If we go on to the next slide, um, what is it? I mean, in a nutshell, it's, it's the technology that provides marketers with attribution and analytics 
for all the conversions that come from inbound calls, um, no matter what channel is driving them. Like I said, if it's email or your website or search or, or offline even, um, you know, calls from, from print mail or radio or TV. And so the benefit is really that your marketing programs are getting full credit, you're getting more accurate ROI uh, for your campaign, and then the, the kind of final piece is figuring out how to leverage that data to more effectively optimize your campaigns and look at driving those, those kind of high-touch, high high-intent interactions with your prospects. So moving on to the, the last slide. So what I really wanted to kind of to leave you guys with is some, some good food for thought on, on the benefits of call intelligence and why it's something as a B2B marketer in, in today's mobile world uh, everybody should really be you know, thinking long and hard about. So the first piece is just getting that full granular attribution for all the inbound phone calls that your, your marketing is driving. Um, you know, some questions to really be asking yourself are, what would my campaign results look like if they included call conversions, not just um, sort of online digital conversions? And you know, by including those conversions, how would this change the ROI of each individual program and then my, my channels as well? And would I be spending more money or spending less? You know, would I be spending differently and investing time and resources differently um, if I'm including the, the kind of full picture and, and getting insight into these offline conversions? To share what we've seen at Invoca, again, just using paid search as an example, because this is one area for me where we've consistently spent a fair amount of money, um, but being sort of a, a newer um, solution in the space, um, paid search has not always proven to have the highest ROI for us. So, you know, every few months, every six months, I kind of go back and forth of, is it really worth us investing in this, is, this channel? And so um, when we started to layer in call data by using, by using Invoca to, to really track those offline conversions, we actually found that 40% of uh, our qualified pipeline that was driven from paid search was coming from calls. Uh, more interestingly, at least for me, it was people weren't calling from the ads. About 70% of our calls from paid search are coming from people who click on an ad, end up on a landing page, and then call us rather than filling out the form. Uh, and so in our paid search results, those were just you know showing up as, as clicks that don't convert, whereas in fact, they were clicks that were happening, driving people to the website, and then people were calling. So, so that was a, a big jump in the results of this channel. And then as a result, by including calls, our, our pipeline to spend ratio, which is one of the key metrics, the key KPIs that, that we use, uh, increased by 166%. So this showed me that paid search was actually a, a much more valuable channel than I had initially thought and gave me insight into how we could be optimizing some of our spend and campaigns to, to focus on driving more calls. So that was really just kind of one example of the benefit of call intelligence. The attribution stuff is, is key. Um, it also lets you to personalize the caller experience a little bit more, which goes back to creating that, that better, more personalized customer experience. So making sure that you're connecting um, the right caller with the right department, stuff like that. You can take that great data from call conversions and use it across your other channels. Um, so an example would be for, for people that call into your business, um, you can retarget them with ads based on what was said during the conversation or what stage they're at in the sales process. And something else that we do at Invoco, which I think is pretty neat, is um, when someone calls in, um, a lead is created in real time for that call in, in our CRM in Salesforce, the same way it would be if they filled a web form. Uh, and then we can automatically drop them into our nurturing tracks in Marketo based on the campaign that they called in from or based on keywords that they said during the call. So um, there are all kinds of neat things to, to be able to leverage with call intelligence, but I think the, the first and kind of most important thing is just getting that attribution locked in. And uh, that's it for me, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pass it on to Winta. Thanks, Julia. That's really awesome. And uh, if history re repeats itself, mobile is only going to be uh, continue to grow and be a bigger and bigger component of B2B. Um, so we've talked a lot about now personalization, Omnichannel, the buyer's journeys. Um, that's a lot of different experiences along the way. Um, so I'm excited that our next next speaker is Wintha. Um, Wintha, you're a total expert on um, experience optimization. So how do we kind of connect all of this together? Okay. Yeah, this is a really great intro, especially the points you made, Julie, at the end about really wanting to create a relevant and personalized experience for your buyer, and it needs to be optimized across all channels. Um, so today I'm going to chat a little bit about how you can experience, how you can leverage experience optimization in your work as a B2B marketer. Um, so if you go to the next slide, let's just chat through a little bit what experience optimization is exactly. 
experience optimization is an ongoing and continuous process to provide the best experience to your customers at each touch point. It means constantly iterating on the experiences you're serving your customers to ensure you're making the most of each interaction. That interaction might be on your website or on your mobile device, as we chatted about briefly before. That sounds great, right? But how exactly does experience optimization allow us to actually do our jobs better as B2B marketers? And today I'm going to focus on three main areas. Our marketing data is filled with a great deal of noise and at times it can be difficult to know what it all means. I know personally that it can be easy to get lost in the wealth of information that we have available to us. However, through controlled experimentation and dynamic experience delivery, we're able to proactively collect data and take action in order to understand how what we do impacts our customers' behaviors. It allows us to have a data-informed view of not only where to spend campaign efforts, but what actually motivates, delights, and engages our customers and prospects and helps them arrive at specific touch points that we want them to get to and hit these milestones. And then once we understand who the right audience is, it gives us focus in our marketing efforts, allowing us to create the best experience for them on our website and throughout our nurture programs and marketing campaigns. So in summary, experience optimization enables you to one, reach the right audience, two, increase engagement and conversion, and three, improve the performance of your marketing campaign. It sounds simple, right? Now, I want to bring this all to life by chatting through a couple of, of examples of how you can actually use experience optimization in your everyday jobs starting today. So if we go to the next slide, I just want to talk through an example that's focused on solving a problem at the top of the funnel and increasing your conversion rate from visitors to leads. Pretty simple and common problem that most B2B marketers might have. Um, to get us started in experience optimization, though, we need a hypothesis to solve this problem. That's really the start of the whole process. So I'm going to hypothesize that symmetrical messaging using a consistent message from ad to website and beyond will increase our conversions. But how do I actually know that making this change will be worth it? And how can I speak intelligently after the fact to my management and team and show that my changes have a tangible and positive impact on our business? And more importantly, I need to establish that this change isn't just a coincidence or a lucky guess on my part, but actually statistically significant as well. So I'm going to go ahead and test it. So I'm using an example. We actually ran this test. We used experience optimization to set up a test with one control and a generic headline and another variation which included a complementary messaging on the landing page as the ad that they actually saw. So making a slight tweak but wanting to see if this will really have an impact on my work. So if you go to the next slide, I'll let you guys know what the results were. So we actually increased our conversion rate from 12% to 17% on these forms by creating a experiment. Um, and this is really exciting for us because it showed how we could optimize an experience for traffic that you're already getting and already paying for and improving their experience such that they're more motivated to engage with you. So you're not spending any additional money, you're receiving 39% more leads and you've proved that the steps you're taking as a marketer have real impacts on your business. Um, to go to the next slide. The benefits of experiments, experience optimization, though, aren't limited to just the top of the funnel, not just focused on turning leads to visitor, or visitors to leads. It really allows you to build out a comprehensive picture of how those customers are engaging with you in all aspects, beginning with that very first touch and through the full life cycle of the customer, because that's what we're really focused on in B2B especially. We're looking at the full lifetime that we have a customer with us. Um, so by constantly testing, you're able to build up learnings, which you can leverage in order to create really tailored experiences, really a personalized experience for different segments of your database. So now that might mean leveraging information about impactful CTAs on your website and later email campaigns or highlighting more relevant resources in the product based on where a customer might be in your maturity model. And, but regardless, the consistent use of experience optimization ensures that you always remain relevant to your customer. So ultimately, experience optimization provides you with actionable data which B2B marketers are able to use to make decisions that increase lead conversions, drive expansion, and reduce churn for their business, truly turning data into action. That's awesome, Winta. Thanks, thanks so much. I really like the uh, customer centricity view uh, of experience optimization. Cool. So, so now we've connected ABM, our phone, our technology, our experiences, kind of all these different pieces are, are humming in kind of one demand machine. Job done, right? <laughs> uh, not so fast. Um, that's why I'm really excited that our next speaker is Sean to kind of talk about uh, lead routing and scoring and really that, that transition point to sales. Sean, why don't you take it away? 
Cool. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, my name is Sean Zinsmeister, and I help uh, head up product marketing here at Infer. Um, so uh, before I joined Infer, I had the pleasure of running marketing operations at Nitro and helping them build out their marketing stack and their nurture programs and had a lot of great learnings that I was sort of able to carry along throughout my career. So before we dive into the actual architectures, I want to just say uh, these are meant to be actually used with any sort of scoring and routing systems, so even starting with something as basic as you might find with your native lead scoring uh, inside, say, a Marketo, Eloqua, Pardot, or, or even something maybe like an autopilot or something. Um, you can get a lot of value with this. And then as you move to more advanced technologies, such as things like you know Velocify or Lean Data for advanced lead routing uh, or something like predictive scoring if you're trying to get you know, a more advanced scoring mechanism that's automated, bringing in a lot more data. So just, just a couple things to keep in mind. So let's dive into the actual uh, architecture. So you can go to the next slide. Cool. So what you're seeing here is a very, very basic how to set up your nurture programs. And the really the hardest thing about marketing operations and building out nurture programs is really like where do you start? There's this like fear of the blank page. And the part of the using the scores are not just to be qualifying leads as they're going in and out of your system, but also to give you an idea of the customer roadmap that you want to set up. You know, how are you going to be using those nurture programs to further qualify leads to be feeding your sales development, right? You know, generating new MQLs um, or even progress aggressively profiling to so another strategy you can use to sort of build out those profiles using uh, using nurture programs. So in this case, you can use something as simple as your native lead scoring um, or a predictive lead scoring to essentially set up everything by what we call lead buckets, or you might heard, hear them called deciles. And so what we set up here is the idea that you want to match your lead bucket to the velocity of a campaign uh, and to the content. So if you just have your A through D leads, you know, you have your most qualified, um, the best looking leads according to your score um, versus, you know, the less qualified leads that might need a little bit more push in the customer journey. You want to make sure that you're matching your message um, as well as what your offer is to be able to qualify them to go into sales development. So, you know, the big constant problem that a lot of marketing teams face from sales is that like sales loves those contact me leads, right? Because they're raising their hand. Many in many instances they want pricing, um, so they're really pretty far along the the buyer's journey. In this case, if you know somebody is a great fit for your product or they've you know shown a lot of buying propensity, we'll talk a little bit about behavior scoring in the next slide. But the key is with those A leads, great thing is to be like, how can I convert more of those A leads into those contact me's? Uh, it's not just like necessarily a contact me offer. That could be like a hard sales offer, it's like a requested demo or something that you know that looks like a good fish. Let's like rush them along. And as you go down the track, right, as you get to you know B leads and C D C leads and D leads, these types of prospect profiles might require a little bit more education. So, you know, this is an example of how you might set out your nurture programs and like introducing a problem statement. You know, once you've you know, educated them a little bit, they get to know your brand and how your solution maps to the problem they might have. Maybe the next step is to then move forward with a harder sales message. And you can see one way to think about it is sort of increasing that the cadence of those messages as you go down uh, from your qualification of your lead. And of course at the bottom, introducing something, you know, if you if you listen to somebody like uh, Dave Lewis over at Demand Gen uh, International, they talk about the idea of a recycle program. This can be something as simple as maybe like a long longer cadence, like a monthly email newsletter where, you know, you still want to keep these prospects. They may not have engaged with any of your, your nurture programs, but you want to still be top of mind, but don't want to be irritating, so you sort of burn out those those prospects. So that's a great example of a recycle program you might be able to, to set up. So let's go on to the next next phase. We'll look a little bit deeper, which is we talked about you know this idea of fit scoring is is something that's prevalent in the predictive world, and there's another type of model called behavior scoring. You know both of these you can sort of break out using your native lead scoring uh, systems as you have them today. So if we zoom in a little bit into those programs that we kind of went over, one other thing is what is the role of behavior scoring uh, and how it plays into your inbound nurture campaigns? 
So part of this is going to be, are they engaging with your email content throughout Nurture, right? Those are very simple if this, then that conditional logic that we can set up that's going to qualify people and sort of MQL the leads, if you were, to be able to push to sales development. And you don't always want to just wait for people to fill out a form in order to have that hard conversion moment because not all of the activity that your prospects are happening uh, is, is, is happening within the realm of those email communications that you're sending out through your marketing automation. You know, they're on the web, they're browsing your, your website. It's very common for you to send a piece of communications to a prospect and then have them double back to your website with perhaps not even opening uh, that email. So there's interest there, but they didn't have that direct response, right? And you as a marketer want to be able to, to, to be able to uh, to really be able to keep that in mind as well when you think about your scoring mechanism. So behavior makes sure that no good lead is sort of left behind, so nothing's falling through the gaps. And this can be done with a mixture of soft offers, you know, where you're just looking at things like blog content, webinars, videos, those are great little engagements to build education. And as those behavior scores build up over time, those prospects are showing more buying propensity. And then you can use that in your automation story to send triggers over to sales and say, hey, this prospect is looking like they're really showing a lot of buying propensity um, over time and they're ready, they're looking like they're ready to buy, right? They've crossed that threshold and they can move into that conversion phase. The other piece is also there's there's different types of behaviors too, right? Where somebody comes onto your website and requests a demo, that's a much, they're showing a lot more buying intent versus maybe just looking at a few articles. But it's just a way that you can sort of start to think about, you know, how you might allocate points if you're using a native lead scoring model inside a, a marketing automation system, or how you might actually take this to the next level with something like a predictive behavior model as well. So let's go to the uh, to the next slide. So the first two architectures we talked about are really focused on inbound and how you structure those customer journeys effectively according to scores. So let's look at the flip side. Everybody's talking about, well, what does nurture mean for account-based marketing? Or maybe in this case, you need to gain more top of the funnel leads, uh, filling, you know, feeding the top of your funnel with outbound nurture campaigns. So first things first, uh, buying a list of leads or perhaps acquiring a list of leads from an event trade show, loading it into your marketing automation system and blasting away is a, is a great way to get in trouble and not get you the results that you need. Um, it just, it, it, these people never opted into your communications and it sort of violates the sort of, you know, Seth Godin principle of permission marketing uh, that actually leads to a better customer experience and of course higher engagement metrics, which we as marketers are, are always after, especially marketing operations folks. However, salespeople, you know, always need new numbers and names to, to contact. And so you really want to be focused on, well, how, can I, as a marketer, be able to push more leads into the top of the funnel, but still being allowed to like not violate that um, that customer experience? And part of the solution here is not only with just great technologies like sequences and cadences uh, that have come up from from technologies like outreach and, and yesware, uh, but also this idea of custom audiences. And so this is kind of a play that I encourage more marketers to think about as they sort of reimagine the list. Whether you're, you know, regardless of what marketing intelligence vendor, and there's there's a lot of great brands out there, a couple we've heard from in the, in the webinar today, and how you're acquiring net new contacts and net new accounts that aren't on your radar using your predictive model, in this case, to sort of understand, well, I want to just focus on who the good prospects are, right? Who, who are the lookalike profiles for accounts and contacts that I want to be reaching? And then as your SDR team, or BDR team, rather, is doing that outreach to those net new contacts, using some of the rise of these custom audience tools such as that's offered by Google Twitter and Facebook that you can actually provide what I call air cover campaigns where marketing is doing more educational content you're staying in front of it right it's like the retargeting 101 type concept you want to be always in front of these new leads and building awareness and gaining those brand impressions and making sure that they know that like as they have that problem for you to solve that you're there with the solution so this is a play that will will definitely work with with predictive scoring and sort of the net new lead generation models um, there is an aspect of it that's complementary to behavior as well so as you are sort of putting contacts into custom audience campaigns you're of course generating more sort of first party interest right they're engaging with your content and so they'll naturally you'll see how they kind of fall into those inbound flows so just a few architectures uh, for you to sort of get kicked off as you think about planning for both inbound and outbound and also account based nurturing programs something else you can sort of add to your, your marketing operations toolkit oh back over to you Dave 
These are awesome flows, Sean. I think uh, I'm definitely going to be printing these out and uh, sharing them with my team. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about creating data. Um, Trisha, you're probably the smartest one I know on on keeping it actionable because um, we know that companies and people are fluid. So why don't you tell us a little bit about data quality management and how you think about it at ReachForce? Absolutely. Thank you, Dave. Hi, I'm Trisha, Director of Marketing for ReachForce, and I'm excited to talk to you all today about how data quality management really serves as the underlying strategy in marketing operations. If there's one common theme you've heard today, it's data. And in fact, you can move to the next slide, Dave. In order to properly fuel the initiatives that we have discussed today, from tag management and account-based marketing to lead routing and lead scoring, the quality of the data of prospect and customer information is firmly placed at the center. When data quality is the prime focus, B2B marketers see an immediate return, not only in their investment, but also in campaign results and opportunity creation. By having high quality marketing data, you're provided with enormous potential for actionable strategies in order to increase your operational efficiency. After all, garbage in equals garbage out. So as we move on to the next slide, how does poor data quality affect marketing? Well, as you saw earlier, what the current marketing technology landscape looks like for marketers and the amount of tools that exist to enable our success. Data quality can vary considerably due to data silos created by using all of these multiple systems. And when data deficiencies aren't addressed, data gleaned from these systems can be misleading, affecting efforts like personalization, lead routing, and of course, lead scoring. You don't want to find your marketing team sending off-topic materials to prospects and customers, or worse yet, addressing the recipient as junk lead when in fact his name is John, just because it was labeled that way in your Salesforce automation tool. However, it can, and it does happen, and that is because data quality degrades as much as 25% per year. And obviously, with that kind of statistic, data quality management is a job that must be done continuously and cannot be just a one-time event. If we move on to the next slide. So how do you get started with this? Well, a marketing operational management plan needs to include internal controls for capturing and preparing data before it is used. There are multiple ways to kickstart or properly manage your data quality. This can be done through real-time inbound lead enrichment, which appends all of the necessary firmographic and demographic company data as soon as the first form fill occurs. Being able to capture this data behind the scenes instead of asking the prospect for it increases conversion rates and frees up space for progressive profiling on your forms. From the example on this slide, you'll see how inbound lead enrichment can enhance progressive profiling, allowing marketers to capture other important data like BANT information. Capturing clean, quality data on the front end directly impacts your top of the funnel results, increasing marketing qualified leads, and enabling proper lead scoring and routing due to the clean, complete company lead data. On the next slide, you'll also see how we can manage data through back-end processes, either on a continuous basis or through batch uploads, both of which provide marketers with a holistic view of their data from all sources. However, as I mentioned before, data quality management is an ongoing process. Therefore, batch cleansing should not be viewed as a long-term strategy, but more of a short-term endeavor. As a best practice, implementing a neutral data integration layer with automatic and ongoing data quality updates provides a single source of truth for all people, company, and transaction data. This provides better understanding of the context of your marketing efforts and their impact on the buyer lifecycle. In summary, implementing a data strategy can happen at various points, but getting to a robust strategy that couples both a front-end real-time solution with a continuous back-end solution will provide the greatest impact. However, the key is to get started. Focus on solving the highest pain point and laying the groundwork for expansion, as better data will drive higher performance and create additional momentum for you and your organization. Thank you, Dave. Back to you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, Trisha. I think uh, 
labeling a, a first name as, as junk is, is probably one of my biggest fears as a, as a marketing leader. Uh, so that's, that's would be pretty embarrassing. Um, so I want to thank, um, thank you so much to all the attendees um, and our amazing speakers, Sam, John, Sean, Julia, Wintha, Trisha, and Adam. Uh, I think I, I took away a couple big uh, pieces here, which is sales alignment, data management, measurement, and then the, the prospect and customer journey. Uh, so we're running out of time here. So if you have any questions, put, put them in the chat. And then what we'll do is we'll share it with all of the, um, all of the great panelists um, to follow up with you kind of after this webinar instead of uh, just getting to, to one or two. So again, thank you everyone for joining. Um, it, it's been a real pleasure to um, share kind of all of our passions with you. Um, and I imagine the panelists kind of feel the same way there. So um, thank you again to the speakers and uh, everyone who was able to join. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Bye.